everybody. Welcome to Barnyards and Backyards Live. Um, I'm Jeff Edwards for UW Extension. I'm in the southeast corner of the state. My co-host today is Hudson Hill. Hudson, make eye contact. <laughs> Morning. <laughs> Good to have you here. And uh, also, um, you may not see her, but uh, Bill, uh, she'll be working in the background. Jenny Thompson is uh, also with us and um, joining us today and helping us keep things running. And our guest today is Kelly Chichester. She is 4-H educator in uh, Niobrara County, Lusk. I had a little <laughs> bit of a brain lapse there. Sorry, Kelly. Good morning. <laughs> no, that's fine. Good morning. And before we totally get started today, I uh, just wanted to remind everybody, if there are questions, please use your mouse and scroll over Zoom and um, uh, type that question into the chat or into the Q&A button, and uh, we will bring those questions forward to Kelly. If you're watching us on Facebook, please uh, use the comments section, ask your questions there. Jenny will bring them forward and then we'll uh, get them asked of Kelly. So Kelly, uh, without further ado, we are speaking today about selecting livestock uh, on your property, correct? Yes. Okay, so, yes. I, so I'm gonna turn the floor over to you unless Hudson has something he would like to say before we start. Good luck, Kelly. <laughs> I'm ready. Okay. All right. You just fill in where I miss. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Oh, so yes. Thank you for having me this morning. And, um, you know, as we are, we were just talking before we got started about the weather, I guess we could start, you know, with some of those considerations and, um, you know, it, it sounds great that we bought some acreage. We're ready to stock it with uh, with our animals, with our livestock. Um, but where where do we actually need to start? And um, you know, for some of those small small livestock, goat, sheep, swine, um, you know, you definitely want to start to take inventory on how many acres do you have, what is available, what is your grand plan um, before you even buy your first animal. Um, you know, what are your resources? What do you have for grass? What might you have for grass if we're in a year like we are today? Is grass even going to be a consideration? Um, I know there's a lot of folks right now that are scrambling, um, small scale, large scale. Right. What's our plan? Where, where are we going to go? <laughs> what, what is our date to know to make those decisions? And some of those are hard decisions to make. Um, uh, you know, how am I going to be able to have enough feed for everything that I have, right? Right. Well, not to deter anybody, but, um, you know, this may be the year if you have not stepped off on um, this adventure, maybe use this as your your learning year, your, um, your apprenticeship year um, to just to further that learning before you use up all of your resources in maybe a week, maybe a month. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's hard to say. And, you know, with some of those drought considerations right now is driving a lot of cost of feed. Um, yeah. Fuel prices are driving feed. I just went and bought a bag of um, chicken feed and they had some posted um, prices of their show feeds. A lot of our 4-H kids right now are starting to acquire their projects and it is going to be an adjustment this year um, on what those feed costs are. So considerations to be made and, and um, you know, like I said, maybe this is the year that you do your learning year and uh, just spend a little bit of time um, furthering that there's some great resources through extension your local extension office barnyards and backyards um, and online other folks in your community that perhaps you just do some learning kelly um, are there i'm sorry to interrupt are there uh resources available uh, to estimate the amount of feed you need per head uh are, are those types of things available they are they are okay. um you know, certainly Google is at our fingertips and sometimes you can get in trouble with just going to Google first. Um, you know, and that's one of the things that I have on my, my list here is to find a mentor and maybe, maybe more than one mentor um, and align yourself with folks that are um, perhaps doing business the way that you anticipate doing business, um, but maybe not. You know, there are other, other sides that you might learn something from, um, you know, so the internet is there and yes, it is readily available, but use, use it with caution. 
Um, definitely know the source of your information. Um, you know, here in the arid West, arid Wyoming, especially, it is a lot different um, developing stocking rates and even just breeds of animals that are available to us, say, than Missouri. Um, you know, so definitely start local. And, yeah. um, you know, of course, work for extension. So I would say visit with your local extension agent if you have one, um, you know, and they can they can definitely guide you to a, a resource, um, a mentor, and find those folks that are doing the business and doing it well. Um, and a lot of times once you develop that relationship, they're willing to tell you what works for them and maybe what hasn't worked. And that could save yourself um, some time and, and money down the road. Okay, very good. So, so Kelly, mm -hmm. I think it's interesting to your comment, and I think it's interesting to talk about it this year. And I, and I think it is a really good learning curve, especially for somebody coming new into some into into a project like this. Do you have a feel for how how much more feed is going to be this year? So right now, like just looking, um, like they had just goat feed, and this is this is a commercial. This is a show feed, so it is a complete feed. Um, you know, twenty twenty two to twenty six dollars a bag. So depending on how many goats you're feeding, where in their production you're feeding them. Um, are you just getting them started on a small amount, taking that goat all the way through to a finished product um, where they're going to be consuming more? Um, you know, you're probably looking at at least a good $400 maybe. Again, it depends. Um, and, and then, and, hey. And how much would that have been usually? I'm wondering about what the increase is. So I think feed, I think, I want to say last year feed costs were, you know, they were, they were up too, but you know, I, they were probably 16, $18, you know, so we're looking at at least a five, five, seven dollar a bag. Um, and that's 50 pound bag um, of a commercial feed. There's definitely cheaper options out there, but you're looking at at least $5 per 50 pound increase. There, there certainly would be cheaper options. Um, I've, there are. I've run the numbers though. It doesn't matter. The cheaper option is still more expensive too, right? Of the, it I've is. Run, I've run the numbers here on, on our poultry project mm -hmm. and uh, we are 40% cost increase on our feed this year. Yeah. Over, you know, and that's last year. And that's, that's hard to, you either got to eat that cost or pass it on to your consumer. And at what point does the consumer say, I can't afford this anymore either you know, and then, then what do you do with your product? Right. Yeah. And so, so marketing and pricing is a whole, I think, different discussion too. Um, you know, so again, knowing, knowing where you're wanting to take your project, what your endpoint is, is it going to be, are you raising pets? Are you raising animals for food? Um, are you going to sell that in product? Um, you know, do you have your market for it? And what are those costs going to be? Um, you know, if you're raising, goats for freezer meat um you know can you find a processor can you find a processing date what does that cost and then what are you gonna have to price that meat at to be able to cover your costs right yeah um you know so like i said maybe this is the great year um to do some of that learning and see where fuel cost level see where feed costs level maybe we'll get some moisture <laughs> yeah hopefully um, yeah, yeah, you know, and so that's just, that's just, we're just talking feed, um, you know, so we haven't even discussed the purchase price of the animal if you don't already have them, um, you know, certainly there's some healthcare costs to take into consideration, um, you know, we all know that with everything else rising and just availability to some of those products that we used to be able to get to treat our animals um, are not, not as available. Um, and that's one of the things that if you are not into a small animal livestock project, um, you know, having establishing that veterinary client relationship will help a lot down the road um, with some of these products and being able to source um, medicine, antibiotics, vaccines, um, even some of our medicated feeds right now are getting hard to, to find um, just because of having to have that veterinary client relationship established. Sure. Um, you know, and as we know, in rural communities, there's not a lot of uh, production animal vets available either. So Kelly, how do we, um, how do we go about or consider livestock for our own purposes mm -hmm. instead of, uh, you know, um, 
isn't that kind of what you wanted to talk about today was more along the lines of, hey, what can I do if I can afford it? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And so, um, you know, knowing knowing what your your plan is. So are you having livestock just to have a pet? Are you having livestock to provide feed for your family, food for your family? Are you having livestock to provide for your family and maybe somebody else? Um, because some of those differences is going to dictate, um, you know, what you're selecting for. Uh, so if I want just a pet goat, I'm going to probably look at a different breed of a goat than I am um, if I'm going to be raising it for food. Um, or do I want to raise and be able to provide my family with goat's milk? Um, so understanding what your, what your goal is and matching it to the resources and then selecting those specific animals to meet those needs. Um, I think is definitely important. Same thing, you know, so if you're looking at a dairy cow, you know what her resources are going to be, um, you know, if you have a surplus of milk, what are you going to do with your surplus of milk? Um, and not only surplus of milk and product, um, but with those animals comes um, waste management. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, so do you have a location to where you can gather um, the manure and waste and either compost it or um, does your local landfill take that? Um, for their compost pile, um, community compost pile. Some, some communities do them, some don't. Um, you know, so there's a lot of considerations on, are you gonna do this one scoop at a time, one wheelbarrow at a time? Are you going to need a tractor? Um, you know, so thinking down the road of that and there again, it all comes at a cost. So are you willing to take that cost on for those or are we going to go with a, you know, the low, low input, maybe higher return. And, um, you know, maybe you've got a couple of kids and this is their project and you're going to get them started and they get to do the labor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Kelly, can we work through the different species and, and, mm -hmm. uh, uh, tell us, um, the pros and cons, why you would select yeah. one or, or would not select one. Yeah. Okay. So we can, um, we can start with goats. Um, so again, you know, it, De deciding if you're going to have a dairy goat or a meat goat or just a pet goat. Um, you know, if you're wanting just a pet goat, you might go with something smaller like a pygmy goat, um, you know, that may meet your resources just a little bit better. They're smaller, they're going to eat less, they're going to take up less space. Um, you know, they're perfectly fine. If you want, you know, something for meat, you're probably going to go with a boar um, or a boar cross goat. Um, typically, what is for eating, for food consumption. Um, you know, if you're going to want to go with dairy, there are lots of dairy breeds. You can research again what, what you want. So are you wanting a La Mancha? Do you want an Alpine? Um, knowing what those breeds are and their specific characteristics. Um, aligning, again, aligning what your needs are with what you're selecting is going to save a lot of time and uh, money in the long run. If you don't care and you truly just love goats, um, then by all means, have one of each. Um, your neighbors will love you for it. <laughs> Especially if you can't keep them in, right? <laughs> right, no, right. No, no wait, no way. Yeah. You, stole, you stole my question there. So, <laughs> so Kelly, you, you've jumped kind of right into the, the business plan, um, thinking about goats. Mm -hmm. if, somebody, if somebody wanted a goat, what would be the first things they considered, do you think? You're going to get a goat. I would, you know, it, you've got to have fencing keep your goat in um you know and i don't know if there is a fence that is goat proof um but there are certainly fencing woven fencing that is better maybe than um you know just your five strand barbed wire fence um different panels um shelter considerations you're going to want to provide them some some break from the wind from the snow um shade in the summer and again um you know how many goats are you going to have how much space are you going to have to provide them um, knowing that goats, you know, they're going to need enough room. Um, are you going to be kidding your goats? So are you going to have baby goats? And do you have a place to take your baby goats out of the weather? Um, again, if you're starting from the ground up, it's a great time to be able to just plan it. If you're trying to retrofit your facilities, um, it may require you to be switching out some fencing, um, perhaps building some shelter or adjusting what you have. Um, so it, yeah, it all depends on, you know, and water, you're going to need fresh water, um, in parts of the state, you know, we run into water issues. Are you going to be able to 
provide enough water or you're going to be hauling water um, to meet those needs of your goats as well. I've, I've always thought it was interesting when people get animals, especially in a small acreage setting, they, they like to name them. And I think goats are really unique because they're all named the same. Houdini one, Houdini two, <laughs> Houdini three, Houdini four. They're all named Houdini in my opinion. Right, so. right. <laughs> yeah. so, Ke so Kelly, I'll ask you this question on every species we talk about, but <laughs> um, why would a person not want to go? Is a goat? No, let me ask that differently. Is a goat for everyone? <laughs> you know, I I think goats have their place. I'm not a goat person, though. Um, I grew up raising sheep and cattle, so that you know, I'm more comfortable there. Um, you know, but I do know, you know, there's benefits to goats too. That you know, they're they're friendly. You can use goats for pack animals. You know, so if you have an interest in that, you can certainly select take your goats and go hiking in the backcountry. Um, yeah, I, I do have goats, Hudson. <laughs> so without answering that question, I think, I think goats is a really good example of, um, regardless of what kind of project someone picks, it needs to be a project they're really interested in. They need to like it, right? Mm -hmm. And people who like goats love them. They have really unique personalities and they have individual personalities um, there's a lot of really cool things about goats, but people who don't like goats really won't like goats. So um, yeah, you should know that before getting into it big time, I think. And and, and that's with every species. But right. I, think goats is, I think goats is a really good example to start with. Well, a lot of it is driven by your interest and your passion and your hobbies, you know. So if you want to make goats, goats milk soap, uh, you know, by all means, have your goats, love your goats. But yeah, so that's kind of, you know, some considerations of goats in a nutshell. Um, you know, if you're going to have a billy goat, um, be prepared. They do get smelly. And if you have neighbors somewhat close, um, they may or may not like you come the summer months when that goat starts to get a little fragrant. Um, so again, that's to, that's to put it mildly, Kelly. <laughs> yeah, you know, and they, you know, the rams, so rams get a little smelly too, but I don't know that there's much worse than a billy goat that's getting a little smelly. So, could be a so little yes. off putting, right? For right. you and your neighbors. <laughs> right, right. You may not want them, um, you know, in the backyard next to your summer barbecue, perhaps, <laughs> you know, I, I, maybe you do. It's okay. You know, no judgment here at all. But, 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 yeah. with, all, but with all of our species, there's a management portion to it, right? Yes. With, with goats, you're talking about one management portion. And the best way to manage that is to n always have a young billy, you know. We, yep. You just don't keep billies past two years of age. So. Mm -hmm. Well, and so that's an interesting thing too, Hudson, that, you know, are you planning on breeding? You know, if you have goats, are you planning to breed them? You know, so if you're going to be milking your goats, you will have to have um, a, a buck at some point or access to one. Um, you know, is that something you want to take on um, for a year uh, to use them for a very short amount of time or um, is our way to kind of do a cooperative if you've got some friends that are into goats as well and you're okay with running them together and if, if you have the cost. if you have friends that are more into goats than you are you can borrow the billy right 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 <laughs> you know there's a lot of um you know small small acreage with sheep um you know that they kind of come together and one person has the space and resources to keep the ram and they bring them together and you all decide that it's going to be this time or you get him, I get him, And then he rotates and runs down the road to the next guy um, to share costs because um, there again, it's, it's, uh, it's pricey to, to invest in one, but um, you know, good genetics do come at a cost. So, yeah. um, so I guess, you know, starting into sheep, unless there's other questions on goats. Um, no, no questions on goats from the, participants that I can tell. Very good. Um, you know, so sheep, sheep are similar to goats. I'm not going to say that they're the same, um, but again, you know, fencing considerations um, and predators, you know, we haven't talked predators yet, um, but a predator can be as simple as the dog down the road. You know, if they've not ever been exposed to, to goats or sheep, 
Um, and it tends to start with a game and they chase them and they run. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, well, they're running. I'm going to chase them more. And then when I get to them, um, you know, sometimes there's an attack or not. Um, and that can be a, a very dire situation, especially if you're then having to take them to the vet or losing um, those animals. So first off, if you can start with good fencing, um, you know, keep your sheep in, hopefully keep your predators out. Um, you know, if you're in such a location where you need to, you know, maybe bring those sheep in at night, um, because predators do become more of a problem at night, um, you know, do you have a facility to where you can lock them in, or at least get them in and safeguard them, um, you know, from, if you're in a situation where there's dogs, sometimes bears, coyotes, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a good thing to look into, maybe not necessary for everyone. Um, you know, there are, go ahead, Jeff, you were going to, what, what are what are some of the uh, pros of having sheep? So, again, if you're wanting to raise your own food, um, you know, lamb is very good um, if it's prepared correctly. Um, you know, if you're a fiber arts person, um, you know, you can certainly have your own wool sheep, wool breeds, um, do some spinning and some fiber arts. Um, you know, if you've got an area, if you've got some pasture area and you don't necessarily want to have to mow everything, um, you know, they make great lawn care. Um, there's some orchards in California that are running um, like cheviettes because they can't reach the leaves in the trees and they take care of all the grass underneath. Um, low input, they yeah. think they lease those sheep, they don't have to run mowers and it's a win-win for everybody. Um, you know, like I said, I like sheep. I think there's good breeds of sheep out there and there's other breeds that are just, you know, they're there. Um, you know, but then if you're going to, so we talked about a little bit of fiber arts. So if you're going to have sheep, you're probably going to have to look at shearing them. So either you've right. got to learn how to do that. You've got to find somebody that knows how to do that, or you've got to, you know, bring somebody in, um, you know, and uh, they're starting to maybe be a little bit more small flock um, sheep shearers, but they're kind of few and far between too. And thankfully extension has um, been hosting some great sheep shearing clinics. So if it is something that you want to learn about, um, you know, it's a great great thing to learn and a great resource to have um you know to to be able to do those things how, how often does an individual have to shear their sheep is it a more than once, once a year once, once a year, a year. okay uh -huh. Uh -huh. but they okay. have hair sheep too so if you don't want to deal with that you can have hair sheep and not even ever have to worry about sharing them um you know so it's typically done in the spring um i'm sorry I, I i the hair sheep thing i i think uh and this is just my own personal thing it's like isn't that a goat <laughs> just sometimes, sometimes no, they look that's like they're definitely molting. your own personal thing there Jeff. <laughs> sorry about that oh goodness sorry so, yeah I, yeah go ahead please continue <laughs> um yeah so in the spring they um you know we'll share them get all that wool off and it provides some cooling throughout the summer it gives enough time for regrowth come next winter and then you're ready to go um so it's a good animal um, practice to shear them. Not everybody maybe does on a schedule like they should. Um, but, you know, one of those things that just make it a, a part of your management process and get them sheared or learn how to do it. It's not difficult, but it, there is a learning curve as with anything um, to do that. And then you've got, you know, the wool. So are you going to spin it? Or are you going to give it away? Um, we're seeing a lot of um, interest right now in the um, use of wool in, in gardens um, for mm -hmm. moisture management, um, some pest management. Maybe there's some benefits to um, uh, fertilizer. So I think, you know, wool definitely has its place and we've seen a, a definite in, increase in the popularity of sheep and wool, which is great, great for those, the, that industry. Is, is tail docking recommended or you know, required I, or not? I, it, it, I guess it would be a personal opinion. I would say yes. Um, okay. From a maybe animal husbandry um, sanitation standpoint, um, but it's one of those things that you want to do it right and do it right the first time. Um, so again, having that mentor, um, that relationship with your vet, um, with extension and making sure that, um, that you're taking those proper steps to do, to do the tail docking. Okay. Yeah. Uh, are there cons to sheep? Well, if you don't like sheep, then yes. Um, you know, I think predators is a big one. Um, okay. You can get into some, you know, possible um, disease 
and animal health problems if you're not managing them right. Um, you know, they're, they tend to be fairly, fairly hardy, I would say. Um, they're again, understanding what, what your end goal is and what breed you're, you're selecting. Um, you know, they, they're, they're, I think I would say they're user-friendly, um, you know, and if, if you're a small flock and you, you know, wanting a good project for your kids in 4-H, getting into 4-H, um, and moving forward as a business, um, you know, I think there's definitely a place for the sheep. Absolutely. When you right. speak small, wait, sorry, Hudson, to interrupt, no, please, when you, please, when go. you speak small flock, are you, is that three individuals? Is it five individuals or does it depend on the space that you have available? It's, it's matching your resources, I would say. Okay. Um, you know, we've got some sheep producers here in Niagara County and North um, and well, even to the West and Converse County, um, you know, they're running thousands of sheep, right. um, you know, that's a whole different ball game and um, a, a different discussion of what they're able to do and can do with their resources versus we're talking three acres, we're talking 40 acres, um, you know, a uh, hundred acres. Um, sure. Yeah. So, you know, three sheep, 10 sheep. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, and is, it's probably something you want to grow into, right? Mm -hmm. Just a couple to start with. Maybe you might want to increase after that. Right. That type of thing. Right. You know, and, and, and with any of these animals, um, biosecurity too. So if you've already got a couple of sheep at home and you see something on the internet, Facebook is a great place. You're, there's always things to be had. Um, you know, use some caution and just, you know, you pick one up, you bring it home, you know, nothing about that animal. You've introduced it now to your flock that has maybe never been exposed. We call it, you know, a, a closed herd or a closed flock. Um, you know, so a quarantine period would be definitely recommended. Um, see what the animal does in two weeks as far as health, nutrition, um, get it up to speed on your, your health plan, your vaccination plan, worming, um, and then introduce them. Um, Cause I think sometimes we think it's a heck of a bargain and maybe it was a, a deal for a reason. Um, not to yeah. say that you can't find a good deal, um, but you know, you don't want to entirely wipe out what you've been building for one or two head. So one of the other things that you mentioned for goats was you said, if you wanted it as a pet, get one, can you have one sheep as a pet or do they, do they function better in a flock? I think a lot, I think, you know, you probably want two, um, two or three, you know, it depends, but you can have one. There's a lot of people that bring in just a bum lamb and start with one and then, you know, build it that way. Um, you know, they, they tend to bond to you if you have one, um, become your friend and your pet. Um, but I think with all animals, like having two, then there's all of a sudden we have a friend and, um, you know, sometimes too with, with food and, um, you know, eating you, you see what's, you have a, maybe a comparator. So this one's acting this way, this one's acting this way. Well, you know, if you don't sometimes have a, a comparator, then, you know, are they both off? Or are they both okay? Or one's playing, one's not playing to sometimes provide that, you know, healthy versus not. And not, not to say they're not both healthy or not healthy, but, um, you know, and, and they are, they're, they're flock animals. They're meant to live in groups. Okay. All right, Hudson, you need to ask your question. <laughs> My question is twofold, Kelly. So some of the some of the most interesting stuff I think that's going on with both sheep and goats right now are is is the research um, how valuable they are to run with other livestock grazing species, and then the, the second part of that, and and you can speak to this too. Mm -hmm. um, weed control with with weed and weed weed. And, with goats and sheep is a uh, is a huge consideration as, as people start to think to get into these projects. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, so I think we've seen that in some of our urban areas. Um, Cheyenne is one that I can think of where they're running goats right downtown um, along some of their waterways to be able to clean up some of those weeds and that grass where they can't necessarily get mowing um, done and help keep some of that under control. Um, you know, so goats are are being used on public land too to help so with some fire mitigation too um you know so there's definitely a place for them and i know people have have done well um you know as an enterprise making money um as a whole other you know you may not think that you can keep 60 goats on your 20 acres but if you've got a place to go with them most of the summer you know maybe that's a viable enterprise too and like you said hudson um 
you know, a lot of folks do run sheep and cattle um, together, or maybe not necessarily together, but they'll put one ahead of the other um, because they select different grasses. Um, you know, sheep and goats select a different grass than, than cattle will select for, and you get the most utilization out of some of your pastures and areas um, because of that. So yeah, yeah, and I think, you know, there's a lot of times too that back in the wild west, you know, there were cattle and sheep and one year cattle was up and sheep were down and maybe the next year sheep were up and cattle were down and it kind of kept, you know, where you could keep everything afloat and keep, keep the bills paid that way too. Yeah, I think, I think there's some really interesting research in the right pasture. You can, you can add a, add a sheep for every cow and you don't have to minus cows. If, mm -hmm. if the, if the, and uh, when you look at the graphs historically, like you said, boy, sheep are up and cattle are down and then cattle are up or sheep are down. And so there, it, it, it does make sense to do, do the two species together. Yeah, if you can make it work, absolutely. Absolutely. Would you like to move into um, cattle or swine? Yes. Yes, so we can talk um, swine. Okay. Um, you know, there's, there are some folks that are keeping swine year round, um, but it's, it tends to be more of a, a seasonal is I guess what I've seen um, where they get the pigs, they feed them out and then harvest them. Um, but you know, there's some of our 4-H and FFA kids that have made um, a good, a good little business with having their swine and being able to breed, um, you know, those sows and sell those pigs either for um, other projects to their 4-H and FFA uh, other members or um, just a very up increase in uh, interest of local food, knowing where your food comes from. And, um, you know, I think there's quite a few folks that have made, um, made their, their projects profitable, just selling freezer, freezer meat, um, feeding those animals out and selling them, um, for, for harvest. Okay. Um, you know, pigs are one of those two that if they're not acclimated, you, you need to, to get them acclimated because you can't just go buy a, a baby pig out of a nursery that's been at you know, 70, 90 degrees, dump it outside today and expect it to, you know, just to run around, <coughs> excuse me. <laughs> to just be fine, right? <laughs> exactly. And I think a lot of times we forget that and they've not been in the sun. Yeah. You know, so then we see health issues and sunburns, um, you know, until those pigs get adjusted and used to that new environment, um, bringing any new little pig home, they need they need a little, sometimes a little extra hand holding just to get through some of those little bumps in the road. But, um, you know, and maybe pigs might be maybe one of the easier ones. There's um, a lot of, a lot of, a um, lot of interest out there and just, you can, you can AI your sow quite easily um, and you don't ever maybe never have to worry about having a boar. Um, and dealing with keeping, again, the two separate and worrying about keeping one in, keeping one out. Um, you know, they're, they're, I, pigs are kind of low maintenance, you know, once you get them established. <laughs> okay. But uh, yeah, any, any health issues that might come up in swine that uh, people should be aware of? Not, you know, just a regular health program, I think is going to be your biggest bet um, or biggest thing. Um, okay. And again, working with somebody, a mentor or your vet, making sure that you're doing those things that, when they need to happen, warming vaccinations, um, you know, in, in sourcing feed, um, yeah. providing shelter, um, you know, but pigs are, I think pigs are kind of low maintenance, really. But again, you know, you run into predators, you know, so you got to yeah. take that into account too. And if you're close to your neighbors, they may become smelly at yep. times. Um, you know, they do, they do like to have a little bit of a mud hole. And if you get some moisture, um, you know, they're going to root, they're going to put a hole probably in the pen. Um, you know, so some of these you have to be okay with, um, you know, if you're not, and you want your landscape to always be pristine, maybe pigs aren't your pick. <laughs> um, you know, but there's other options. Okay. So, Yeah. Okay, uh, so uh, Jenny reminded me that cattle are probably a little bit too large for our discussion here, and so um, she thought maybe we should spend a little time talking about fowl. All right, yes. Your well, favorite subject, and I yeah. know Hudson will kick in here a little bit. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. 
you know, and right, right now is, um, you know, maybe a, a great time to, to visit that biosecurity, like we talked about, you know, if you're starting to introduce other animals, um, you know, we've all been reading quite a bit on the highly pathogenic um, influenza or avian influenza, um, you know, that's, that's being found and detected in birds um, within the state. Um, you know, so if you are bringing outside birds in, I would definitely adhere to that quarantine uh, period. Don't just dump them in, wish them well, and hope for the best. Um, you know, they may or may not have been exposed. It's, it's hard to say. Anything can look healthy until, you know, maybe five days in, seven days in. Um, but yeah. Okay. So right now you can hear, I've got chicks in my office peeping away. <laughs> um, our 4-H Friday kids, um, we put those in the incubator and we're on day 22 right now. So I've got 13 healthy little chicks hanging out back there. Um, they'll go back to uh, their original where we got the eggs from, they're willing to take them back. Um, but okay. again, knowing. Okay. But, yeah. Um, so just my own ignorance here, uh, does, is avian influenza, does it affect all birds? Yes, okay. it has a potential to, yes. Okay. Yep, right. yep. And that's, you know, they're seeing a lot of it from, um, you know, wild birds coming in and either commingling in the water, the feed, um, you know, somebody's enclosure or not enclosure um, and transmission is, has the potential to happen. Okay. So let's pretend that avian influenza is not a problem this year. Mm -hmm. uh, what types of things would you be looking at or for um, with, uh, with uh, birds, uh, ducks or geese or? Yeah. Or, okay. So, you know, again, knowing what you want. Um, so if you want birds that you are just going to have around some hens around and you just want eggs solely for eggs, um, you're going to want to select those breeds that are going to be good layers. Um, you know, there's some that are selling eggs that the Easter eggers, so they have a beautiful colored egg, um, you know, so it, from a, your typical white egg, there's, um, you know, you can get blue, green, and browns. Um, if eggs aren't your, your thing and you just are wanting to raise um, birds, poultry for uh, meat, you know, there's breeds to select just for that. Um, shorter term project, uh, you definitely don't have to commit to them for an entire year, which makes it nice. Um, but um, again, predators, predators in your poultry yeah. um, can be a problem. And, um, and don't, don't name your, your poultry, right? Right. Yeah. Because it's always the first one that goes. Yes. It's always the pet. Unfortunately. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, yeah. Makes it just a sad day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm sure Hudson can relate to that. I thought they were all named drumsticks, so I named them all. <laughs> and you don't have to keep it straight. Yeah. <sighs> But yeah, it's so the same with your ducks. Um, and there's quite an interest in uh, turkeys right now, um, just because of their end product is a great thing to have um, come the holidays, anytime, I suppose. But, um, you know, same thing with ducks that, um, you know, there's definitely laying ducks and then meat ducks um, that you're gonna eat as well. Um, but you can have pet ducks, pet ducks are great too. Um, yeah, so it's, you know, again, understanding what you're wanting to do with these birds. If you truly just want pets, then I would get some and definitely get eggs and put some money back into your project. Um, I was having a conversation the other day with someone that said, you know, feed costs have gone up so much that for what I'm selling eggs for, like I, I can only increase my egg costs so much before people aren't going to buy them. Um, yeah. You know, you've got a premium product that is maybe more superior than what you're getting at the grocery store. But if you're pricing yourself out of business, um, you know, it's hard to make ends meet. But, exactly. You know, so, so Kelly, um, mm -hmm. I actually was having this conversation last night that you're, you're, you're talking about. I think with all these projects, it's, it's important to have a, a, a business plan um, and then a production plan and then understanding how, when we're doing it, um small in the backyard how we're doing it the same but different right so if if someone was having a problem with uh cost of feed 
and, and we can talk about all the species this way, but 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 what would their options be, especially with 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 uh, layer hens? As far as mitigating costs, yeah, feed costs. Well, you know, I it, it depends on where where your level of comfort is in perhaps losing money, um, but you know, it, it comes to can you afford to continue to do it? And do you just do a, you know, kind of short term, you can do short term layers too. So keep them for a bit and then put them in the freezer and you can start with a new batch. Um, but, you know, dollars and cents that if you have disposable income and you really truly enjoy your chickens, I don't know that we will convince you to get rid of your chickens. If it is truly a business, um, you know, business adventure, you're going to know where your prices are going to be and either it's going to pencil or it's not. And sometimes that drives us out of the business. I, maybe I didn't answer my question. I asked my question very well. Um, you know, an, an insect is 32% protein. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people with a few backyard hens are uh, buying a complete feed and that's awesome. You've really got to focus on your calcium and stuff, but there's a lot of ways to introduce feeds that are a lot cheaper chickens are little tyrannosaurus rexes they'll eat basically anything that's there um so so you can introduce other stuff even even hay you can mm -hmm. buy cheap 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 peas sometimes mm -hmm. um um yeah there's there's lots of different they'll they'll eat clover and dandelions and and, and there's lots of things you can do to to cheapen that up if you're having that issue with 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 chickens and i think that's one of the interesting things about chickens uh you can use chickens as insect control around the yard yeah so. yep all good points absolutely guinea fowl turkeys those types of things they're all good at uh, uh chasing insects aren't they mm -hmm. yes little snacks hey speaking of insects uh we also mentioned uh that you might want to talk about bees as, as livestock as well right yes yes okay yeah so yeah bees so it sounds odd but they are considered livestock um and we follow a lot of the same um like veterinary feed directive so if we have an issue and we need to treat bees for anything um yeah the vets look at them as livestock um you know bees are bees are interesting we have some bees here that our 4-h members um manage and sometimes so bees it sounds great we all love honey um but as with any project there's a considerable um investment to be made right. um just in all of your hive costs um the bee cost um to get started um so it's it like anything else it's a commitment uh they do require some management throughout the the year um so you can't just plop them in their hive wish them well and you know go see them at the end of the summer and let you know take the honey and move on and say um, thank you <laughs> right right yeah you know, definitely want to thank them at some point um but no there there is some management that needs to occur to make sure that um so each hive has typically should have one queen um the queen does all of the the egg laying which then keeps your population up um you know so if your hive goes awry um, and you lose your queen um, for whatever reason uh you're going to see a decline in numbers until either hive completely dies or they they can get themselves right it again um but that takes time and it's you know does it could or could not cannot affect your your production so yeah. it's think, uh you know and what's that go ahead husband. sorry well i think i think bees are really an interesting um species to to make this point you know you have to have a business plan and a production plan and i think the business plan on bees is the easiest the easiest one right? It's pretty easy. You can see what a newt costs. You can see what, but the management plan is, isn't, and this might be me and the people I work with, but it's different than other animals, your, your management plan. So, mm -hmm. um, I think, I think you should speak about two things with the bees before you end up with them. One is overwintering them, um, yep. especially from location to location. Location is really important to understand in western wyoming bees are a lot different to run than in eastern wyoming and then uh um i think the thing that really is uh a, a hurdle for people is parasite control with the bees yeah yep yeah so 
definitely, you know, your location is going to dictate a lot of the success of your bees. Um, but that's not to say that you can't have bees in a very dry area. Um, here in Lusk last summer, we were hot, we were dry. Um, you know, and understanding that as with any of these animals, knowing your resources and identifying when it's maybe time to increase the feed, decrease their feed. Um, you know, we did some supplementation of feed for our bees just to get them through the winter because it comes to a point where um, maybe we're not as concerned about their honey production because we are considered hobbyists um, and more concerned about their health and well being to be able to overwinter. Um, and so you want to make sure that they're set up late summer, early fall for that success um, of the winter, that they've got enough um, resources and stores in their hive uh, to be able to carry themselves because they won't, you know, they're, they're not going to come out in the winter. They basically go into hibernation or they call it torpor um, through the winter. Um, so they don't, they don't come out of their hive. So they're relying solely on what's there and what's available. Um, until it's spring, it warms up a little. When it starts to warm up, they will come out, um, do a cleansing flight, get rid of some business, and then back into the hive again. Um, their whole mission through the winter is to keep the queen warm, keep her healthy, and keep her alive. Yep. Um, so yeah, um, you know, and people, a lot of people worry about snow, um, snow around the hives, which really has no impact on it. It makes actually a great insulation for those hives. Um, just so long as you keep an entrance clear so that on a nice day, the bees can come in, come out, and they've got some, you know, airflow, air exchange happening. Um, you know, sometimes we maybe over, try to overprotect them um, and can kind of create some problems too with wrapping them in insulation or blankets or different covers, um, which tends to work well and we think we're doing good things, but it may actually end up being a trap for uh, moisture. And you don't want to get a bunch of moisture in your hive. Um, that's you know one of the things that can certainly kill them over the winter. Um, Contributing to disease and those types yeah, of things. Yeah, 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 and definitely you know disease mites. Mites are one of the biggest things that we worry about in um, honeybees. And knowing your your bees doing mite counts, um, there's easy ways to manage that. There's um, different treatments. Some are maybe more natural than others. Um, you know, there's a different, a lot of research and breeders out there trying to find, is there a mite resistant bee? And if so, how do we capitalize on that? Um, you know, so it's, you know, one of those recommendations, again, work with a mentor, find somebody that's willing to, there's a lot of, um, in Wyoming, especially, which is great, um, beekeeping groups, um, that are willing to come out and help. I've had some of them travel from Laramie, from Casper here to Lusk to, to walk us through, you know, on just some questions and issues that we might have or see. Sure. Uh, um, yeah. Jenny reminds me that, uh, all hives need to be registered with the Wyoming Department of Agriculture and, yes. uh, and there might be, uh, ordinances against having bees in the city limits. So yes. those types of things you need to be aware of yeah. just, just like any other livestock there right. might be ordinances against having them in city limits so um right. make sure you check with your mm -hmm. uh town mm -hmm. if you're if you're planning on or would like to have any type of livestock uh, yeah you know and the registration on the hives is not so that they they're not you know they can come and do an inspection um but it's more for um so we got notification that there may be grasshopper treatment um, and they let us know like what they're going to be treating for grasshoppers and at what stage of the grasshoppers. Um, so there's nothing is ever a hundred percent safe. Um, but they do let you know that there may be treatment. They will contact you and let you know so that you can either cover your hive or, um, you know, if you have the ability to move it. Um, so it's not just them wanting to know where you are and what you're doing. There is a true reason, um, for that. And it's to safeguard your bees from some of this stuff. And some of the towns do use it um, for like their mosquito abatement program. So they let you know they'll be treating um, so that you can put a wet sheet over your hives just to help, um, you know, mitigate any loss, if at all. Yeah, th that's primarily the reason to register your mm -hmm. hives within yes. the city limits is because of these yep. treatments and things that happen. They'll, they should notify you and let you know right. that it's going yeah. to happen. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and some people, you know, are a little off put by it because 
you know, somebody's going to know what they're doing, but it, there is a legitimate reason and it's a good reason if you want to keep your yeah. bees alive. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, um, you, I, I think we're, oh, uh, Jenny says rabbits. Do you want to oh, talk yes. about rabbits? Rabbits. <laughs> We can certainly talk about rabbits. Um, you know, rabbits are are fun. They're they make a great pet, um, especially for kids. I know there's some folks that have rabbits in the house that are house broke rabbits. Um, we have a lot of kids in 4-H that are in the rabbit project. Um, and you know, again, rabbits are they're pretty simple. Um, some of them live their entire life in hutches. Some come in the house. Some you can you know let roam through the yard. Um, you know, as with anything, we've seen some disease sweep through rabbits. I think we're on the hopefully tail end of that, which impacted life, what was it, two years ago, um, with the hemorrhagic yeah, rabbits. I, should yeah, I, can't, up. I can't remember what it was yeah, called either. <laughs> but it, um, you know, it had an impact on wild rabbits, and it did have an impact on a lot of our um, shows and just um, domestic expos of those rabbits, too. Um but I think with rabbits too, the considerations we need to make sure that we're taking into account are, um, you know, winter cold. So a lot of those, if you don't have a place to move those hutches in, out of the wind, out of the cold and keep those rabbits comfortable, um, you know, they're, they're going to be susceptible to, um, you know, some, some health problems, um, possibly even death. And on the same side of that, um, the heat, heat stress on rabbits is a big deal too. Um, you know, so making sure that you've got your rabbits to where you can at least get them some shade, get them a little bit of protection, um, provide them with a fan if you can, um, keep them comfortable too. Um, but yeah, rabbits, you know, a good rabbit, they live, they live a long time and rabbits are fun. Um, you know, and there's, there's folks that do raise rabbits for meat. Yep. You can eat rabbits. Um, so yeah, I, I've had rabbit a few times and I don't mind it. I, it's pretty good. Like they say, it tastes like chicken. <laughs> so, so so kelly i was i was gonna make sure to make that point um you know my personal belief is if people want pets they should have kids and uh, everything everything else should be for production right but with with the rabbits when you look at the business plan on rabbits if you are only interested in making protein rabbits make a lot of sense they the the, the input costs and the ability to uh, um, produce like rabbits, I think is the term, or reproduce like rabbits, is, is, is really interesting when you put it to a business plan. Rabbits make a lot of sense economically to produce protein. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, they're, you know, like I said, for, for a young family, young kids, like rabbits may be a good, a good place to start. Yeah, because they're, you know, again, they're pretty user friendly. Yeah. Yeah, they really are. Uh, any, you know, uh, we're getting close to the end. Any other things? Let me, we'll, we'll do a final call for questions. Uh, I have not seen any come through on Facebook from Jenny. Um, very little on, uh, uh, on Zoom today. Uh, but any Weather's final thoughts? Nice. What's <laughs> they're too nice. No, the weather, the weather's too nice. Outside. Oh, the weather's too nice. Everybody's outside. Yeah. <laughs> um uh any wrap-up comments that you would like to do kelly uh yeah so you know if you're interested in getting into any of these projects or you have any questions um you know definitely reach out to your local extension office um get a hold of you know me um hudson jeff can direct any of us right i'll, I'll point people to people they need to talk to <laughs> right you know and that's the thing is that you find the people that know the information you align yourselves with you know good mentors and um you know if it's something you're truly passionate about people do well um but some of this it it isn't for everyone like it's a commitment once you have those animals you can't just put them on the shelf and walk away for two weeks on your vacation and come back and expect it all to be all fine and dandy um you know yeah. It's, it's a commitment, it's an investment, um, but it can be a lot of fun and it can be, you know, a rewarding experience that, um, you know, some of us look for, especially at the end of the day, if you've got a high stress job, um, you know, sometimes seeing those animals out in your backyard is what it takes to, to make the day end on a high note. So come, come home and snuggle the pet goat at the end of the day. Right. Yes. Take your bunny out for a walk, whatever it may be. So Absolutely. You, you guys are joking a little bit, but 
there therapeutically you're 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 right yeah. on kelly yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah i i think that, i think you made the key point though that if this is something you enjoy it can be a, a wonderful life experience um in lots of different ways uh i i, I quote I quote an, 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 a person in one of my classes one time often, but she, she mentioned that the reason she should do it is to, um, to, to help sustain life, you know? And so uh, you, you made a really good point there. Um, the, the one thing I, I don't know that we've touched on very good today is, and, and you just was talking about it, you said, uh, find out from people who know. But once they find out from people who know, what, what do they do with that information? What, 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 what Well, I think sometimes when you start into a new new adventure, um, you know, there's lots of people that are willing to help you and share information. And it's just going to take time, you know, maybe a year, maybe two years to sort out and say, okay, great information. Well, I got the information it may or may not be applicable and start learning. And that's where, you know, having a few different avenues and gathering information is helpful. So everybody's got a different perspective and a different way to do things. And that's okay. Um, that's how we learn is from those different perspectives. And then you'll soon start making decisions of, yes, this is great. I can work with that. And you'll continue to find those people um, and maybe not seek the information out, you know, from other sources that may not have fit your situation um, exactly. And, and that's okay. That's okay to, you know, to, to find and move, move on. That's really a perfect answer. You know, with all of these projects, regardless of species, within each species, picking the right species and then picking the right breed within species. Um, every person has different resources. Every person has different abilities. There's going to be a learning curve for everyone as they start a project like this in their backyard. And, and you just have to expect that. And with all agriculture endeavors, um, you don't ever have to worry about catastrophe because catastrophe is just normal in all of agriculture. So just plan on it, and it's not a catastrophe. It's just part of the management plan, right? Just yep. expect something bad Jeff to happen. Jeff knows about that a little now. Yeah, exactly. Well, they always say, you know, if you have livestock, you're going to have dead stock. You know, it's <laughs> at some point, like Tudson said, catastrophe will strike, and how you deal with that will depend on, you know, how you move forward. My, my grandfather's quote was a lot more colorful than I'm going to make it, but it was, you know, there's an easy way not to have livestock pass away on you. Just don't have them, right? So, and that's the only way, that's the only way to mitigate the, the inevitable fact that um, there's just a certain amount of mortality in trees, bushes, flowers, and livestock. Yep. yep. Okay. Well, great. Hey, on that note, Kelly, I want to thank you for your time today. Thank you for thank being you. with us. Good job. And, and and Hudson, I'd like to thank you for your time as well to be uh, the co-host and, and provide commentary as well. Thank you very my, much. My pleasure. This, unfortunately, is our last episode for Barnyards and Backyards Live for this season. Uh, but um, if you have questions for your uh, local extension folks, we have offices around the state, uh, which Jenny has now thrown up. There is a uh, county or, or there's an extension educator in almost every one of the counties. There is at least an office in every one of the counties. And uh, that information is available on the internet if you would like to contact one of us and chat about any of the topics that we've talked about on Barnyards and Backyards Live. We also keep a uh, record of everything that we've presented uh, it's available as a recording now we will also provide links to other resources that are available to you within there um, so if there was a topic on fruit that you wanted to check out you can go back and find or uh, watch the video or find any of the links that are available there um, uh, what else jenny what else do i need to talk about as we wrap up here Thank you. Got it all. Did I get it all? Okay. Well, uh, thank you all for watching. And uh, we might be doing this again in the fall. We haven't discussed it yet. But uh, again, thank you, Kelly, for joining us. And uh, we'll, Hudson, we'll see you later. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>